the planet Earth. Some call me nature. I am very passionate about the planet Earth. A living, breathing planet capable of sustaining whatever life forms we see fit to deposit on it. Spock, judging by the pollution content of the atmosphere, I believe we have arrived. It's the planet stupid. No, no, no. It's the planet stupid. Our guide for It's the Planet Stupid is eco-journalist Belinda Weymouth. <laughs> nice to have you in the mix always, Belinda. Thank you. Thank you. What, nice to uh, be here. Yeah. What do you point us to today? Uh, well, should we start? What do you want to start with? Good news? Not so good news? You tell me. I've got, I mean, I've got both, of course. No, I know. And uh, I always feel like it's, well, it's how you sell uh, the good or the bad. It's all in the sell. <laughs> so I leave well, it to you. You're okay, the let's, let's start with the good news because I think okay. this is pretty exciting. The new president of Mexico, drumroll, ladies and gentlemen, is a climate scientist. So yes. she was one of the authors of the IPCC, the Inter a governmental panel on climate change that wrote, you know, the seminal paper telling the world or warning the world about the burning of fossil fuels. So the fact that we have someone who has a doctorate in energy engineering in charge in Mexico, and she's been the mayor of um, Mexico City, so 23 million people. There she is, uh, Claudia Scheinbaum, her name is. Um, uh it's it's fantastic because you know she's she is climate change literate and she has uh while she was the mayor of mexico city she put in this huge solar array on top of their biggest uh mexico's it's a wholesale market and she uh solar paneled the entire uh rooftops of the market she put in bike lanes uh she started the electrification of their public bus system and she's really a pragmatist you know she wants to decarbonize her country and transition to renewable energy but you know she's a statist she wants to do it with mexico's um you know mexican companies and one of the things that's really challenging is that mexico is the 11th largest uh, producer of um oil in the world and pemex uh their big nationally owned oil company produces two million barrels a day so uh, Ms. Scheinbaum is not going to get rid of that. She says we're going to keep, you know, oil levels where they're at, but we're going to move the company into um, lithium production, so batteries for storing renewables. In 2015, she had a, uh, a research paper that was all about the shift for Mexico um, to renewables. She wrote a really good one, um, uh, actually, about wind turbine installation in so they had this big installation that happened about 10 years ago it was in Oaxaca which is the poorest state in Mex in Mexico and it was it created a lot of conflict with indigenous people and for her that was a real wake up call like yes we need to you know install uh renewables but we really have to look at the communities we have to tread carefully and we have to make sure that this makes sense and is good for you know everybody the people on the ground and also the people who will be getting you know the the clean energy so so i think she's got a really sort of humanist approach to this uh and i think it's really exciting that our at our southern border we have the potential you know to you know have partnerships and really look at you know uh, joint decarbonization and climate change mitigation um, strategies. And, you know, it's wild to see, and we're seeing a little bit of the West this week, the short-term effects of the climate chaos that is ensuing, meaning that you've got intense heat, you have it you know, earlier in the season, you'll have more of these intense weather swings as a result of this overall climate issue. Mm -hmm. But I related to what you're talking about now in relation to Mexico, because they have another problem there, as you're aware, and that is that they're running out of water. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And Mexico the, City. Mexico City, where she was mayor, as you just noted, and she was uh, so forward thinking also, as you've noted, in, in so many ways. Uh, there are some things you just can't run from uh, and you can't, you know, create your way out of. And uh, sadly, running out of water is one of them. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, remember a couple of weeks ago we were talking about the the um, the uh, mantled howler monkeys who were falling out of the trees dead. You know, I mean, that was terrible. That was in Mexico. Uh, so, yes, water is a huge issue. And in Mexico City, you know, you've got reservoirs that aren't full. You've got crumbling infrastructure. You, it's a big, big, sprawling city. I mean, there are parts of Mexico City that aren't actually hooked up to proper sewerage systems. So, it's a huge metropolis, and um, yeah, the the problems are dire. They're real, and they're now. And you know, this the, the heat and the drought, and this you know, obviously the water situation, you know, is coming from you know directly from the drought are really real. And so, yes, to have someone who's had real hands-on experience with the um, the emergencies that our heating planet are causing, I think is is a positive but yeah man she, she really faces some challenges and, and you know this relates to old infrastructure they can shore up a bit of this problem but it, ultimately it, it's a supply issue so uh mm. in the chat uh wes says wow a woman with a doctorate and we in the united states are on the verge of possibly letting a man who cannot read back into the <laughs> oval office <laughs> sorry <laughs> or maybe uh, he can nice read. one wes thank you yes he says wes says or maybe he can read but he doesn't Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no. She's 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 so yeah, and she's got a doctorate in the you know the right uh, science for right now. I mean, energy engineering, right, is, It's fantastic. Right. Yeah, you know, very good I point. mean, she's she's just she's just the kind of leader that is needed right now. So, uh, you know, yeah, well done, Mexico. And well, um, also a woman. There are a lot of things that you know we just yep. can't seem to quite get our. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. country to embrace come so, on so. america yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, come on you can do it we have we? a system that's it's pretty hard to swim upstream against the currents uh, politically mm. in this place america but uh maybe it'll happen um mm. so that's the good news so you have this forward-thinking insanely well-informed climate scientist who is mm. a woman who is mm. leading this huge trading partner for uh, for us in America and also an incredibly influential immense country Mexico. Yeah. What's the yeah. bad news? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to get to that I'm afraid. So we have news from Panama um, uh, about their first uh, climate refugees and moving them. They're moving 300 families off the, um, so the name of the, it's a little atoll, it's in the Caribbean, um, and its name is uh, uh, Gadi Sug. Sug Dub. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And, and I sent um, some photographs. I mean, this is unbelievable. So it's 400 yards long. It's 150 yards across. It's 20 inches above sea level at its highest point. And as you can see, every square inch of this place is covered. So what's happened is, you know, sea level is rising and um, it's inundating the homes. They have to be moved. I mean, Panama has got 63 coastal communities, both on the Caribbean side and on the Pacific, uh, who are going to have to be moved, 38,000 people. So these first 300 families who are being moved, um, it's a um, an eight minute boat ride and a mile in shore where they're going to live. Uh, they have built them homes in the jungle. Um, they will be able to go out, you know, back and fish. But as you can imagine, the upheaval is absolutely enormous. And moving this many people, uh, the price tag is, um, uh, I think it's about um, 12 million. But to move all the people that they need to move is going to cost the country $1.2 billion. But you know, bravo that they're doing it, that they, you know, that this is, I mean, they say that, you know, the storms are just so much worse, you know, that the sea level rise is, you know, it's just inundating. And 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 in the pictures, there's a whole, um, I'll, I'll tweet it so our, our viewers can go, look, oh no, we can see them here. There's one of a pig that's living, you know, sort of on stilts, you know, above the, the seawater. I mean, that's where they, you know, they have to keep their livestock. Um, but... Uh, I mean, it, you know, it's a, it's a, as you say, I mean, they're moving, there's really not much choice but to move them. Um, no, no. And, and not everyone wants to go. So they are allowing, yeah, see the, I mean, look, if you can see right outside its window, it's got a, you know, an ocean view. Um, but that's pretty precarious. And, uh, 
not everyone wants to leave and what they're doing, which I think is really good, is that it's not an enforced evacuation. It's like, okay, the pe- the 300 families who want to go and the other people will stay until it's, you know, sort of unlivable. But what the people who are leaving already are saying, it is unlivable. You know, it's flooding, the storms are worse, the heat is unbearable. Um, and this is just what is facing islands. I mean, I've talked about it before on the show, you know, the Carteret Islands, which are these Pacific islands near Papua New Guinea, they started talking in 2006 about having to leave. And in 2017, they, they started moving them. And I don't think they were nearly as well set up as as these uh, as the Panamanian government has been for these people. Their houses are all ready. Um, there's a picture of them as well. They're in the jungle. So it's going to be very different because they live this in, you know, this real island life. Um, they're used to tourists coming. Uh, they're used to being able to, you know, go out and fish for three or four hours every day. Uh, it's going to be quite different. And obviously we're going to, this is going to be a real thing that we're we're really going to experience during our lifetimes. Um, both as well, we are experiencing it in this country, aren't we? In North Carolina. Oh, oh. Oh, okay. It's North wild Carolina. what's happening in okay. North Carolina. Tell everybody yes. about that. Okay. So last week in the Outer Banks, North Carolina, Rodanth, um, the sixth house in the last four years uh, was demolished by the ocean. And this is, um, I mean, it's really a big deal because the amount of um, uh, debris that you get from one house is enormous. And so they have to be standing by and ready for when that house, when you know the, the salt water finally encroaches and it's over. I mean, the house was uninhabitable because the septic tank doesn't work anymore. And, um, you know, that the owners haven't been able to live there. Uh, but it's a five bedroom home. So this oh, is okay. not a small house. No, no, th- these houses are enormous. I mean, I just sent you, Tony, another photo of a house that got moved. I mean, this was kind of crazy. They only moved it 50 yards back. I mean, the moving is really, really expensive, but the debris can stretch for miles down the beach. And you have to remember, these are very you know, eco-sensitive habitats, you know, turtles are out there. This is their habitat too. Um, and, and what's interesting is last year, the government, um, the National Park Service bought two of these houses that were, you know, endangered for $700,000 and immediately demolished them. And and they said, we are going to turn this into, you know, public beach access. And this is going to see this is, you know, yeah, they, thank they you, say Albert. that is that. Thank you for putting that up, because that debris is why they bought these places, because that debris can be incredibly harmful and disruptive oh. to national oh, yeah. the natural habitat. Yeah. Yeah. They say there are mattresses and cutlery and there are domino sets. And, you know, not to mention all the you know, you can see timber there with great big nails, you know, um, sticking out of it. So, yeah, it's hugely dangerous. And. Of course, the, a lot of people are demanding. Oh, I just have to tell you something really that is kind of fantastic about the two houses that were bought for $700,000. This was not taxpayer money. So there's this fund, which is called the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It was established in 1964 by Congress. And it was the idea of it was to save cultural and environmentally important places. Guess what it's funded by? Offshore oil drilling. Not that's just beautiful. Dollars. That's so, just beautiful. So it's sort of full circle. And the irony of it is, you know, we burn fossil fuels and this is what happens. But fossil fuel uh, profits is, you know, paid for these, you know, and these people were really smart to sell their houses because, you know, take the money and, and get out. I mean, to move your house you know, away from the ocean is hugely, hugely expensive. Um, well, they, you know, a lot of what you're talking about is uh, the clear threat and the clear danger and the clear imminent eventuality that your house isn't going to be there anymore, destroyed by, and so uh, destroyed by the surf and rising sea. But Mm -hmm. uh, the owners of the house sold in 2021. It wasn't a long time ago. Well, this is the thing. I mean, yes, people, you know, there's a, there's a really sad story about this couple who they bought it as their retirement. One of the houses that um, is, you know, uh, uh, I think, yeah, the, la- the one last week, 
that was their retirement dream. And they looked at all the other, you know, quite a few houses and they decided on this one because they love this area. I mean, the crazy thing is this is only four inches of sea level rise. And this is the kind of damage it's being done. You know, we love the ocean and we build too close to it. The crazy thing is a lot of the people who live there are saying, you know, you need to replenish the replenish the beaches. Well, that costs millions and millions of dollars. And the fund that this county has that would, you know, include that uh, uh, along with all their other expenses right now is sitting at $6 million. And, and that's just not nearly enough. And remember, we talked about that uh, community in Massachusetts that had all that sand bought in and they said, okay, our beach is fine now. And do you, do you remember we talked about it, how long that sand lasted when they re-sanded the beach? It was, a, it was an obscenely short amount of time. 72 hours, ladies and gentlemen, 72 hours. I mean, it was, you know, you, you just, you know, you can't do it. And, and the island in Panama, they had been um, putting pillars and coral and all these things. But when you put hard surfaces, you know, and I see it up in Malibu, you know, the Malibu colony, you know, they put these great big boulders up in front of their, their um, properties. Well, that just causes the ocean to scour even faster because it goes all the way around these boulders and pulls out more sand. You need you need mangrove swamps. You know you need uh, the waterways that are actually supposed to be there, the wetlands, all the things that we've taken away. That's what gave us a buffer. You know these these pylons and putting in great boulders. That actually just exacerbates the erosion that's going to happen. It's um, such a uh, a stark reminder of what the future is. I mean, it, it's not just the future. It's I mean, it's no, the it's present. Now. But I'm saying there'll be more of it in the future. And so this program that you talk about with the Park Service buying these homes and then destroying them right away because that's a better fate for them to be dismantled than well, for them to be destroyed and for the debris to be everywhere essentially. But that's the business we're going to be in increasingly. Well, yes, and it's like, you know, where do we find the money? Because they did the two houses. There's no, you know, there isn't talk about them, you know, buying all the houses along the beachfront. And and they did specifically, they targeted these two homes where, you know, the septic tanks, one of the septic tanks was still working. That house got more money when it sold. The one that had the, you know, non-functional septic tank and was uninhabitable, uninhabitable got less money. But it's like, you know, where do you find the money and... um you well, know, they'll have it, to be. They'll have to be funding. That'll be earmarked for this. That'll be dedicated to this. I mean, it, it, there's going to have to be, and this is not just North Carolina. I mean, this is going to happen in Florida, and it's going to happen along coastal communities uh, nationwide. It's a it's a real problem. That's why when Trump says irresponsible things like, "Oh, it's an eighth of an inch over the course of whatever," I mean, he doesn't know what he's saying. No, he's no, just no. kind of minimizing yeah. it all. But it, it's really destructive because it does minimize what is a a serious threat to so many Americans and so many people nationwide, uh, uh, worldwide, as you just showed in Panama. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, well, the thing is that the, Rodan, that's four inches of sea level rise only. I mean, it's 4.6, so it's almost five inches. But yeah, it, it, they sound, it, it sounds incremental and tiny. But, you know, um, okay, so famous, beautiful city, Venice, you know, built on a, you know, a lagoon. I mean, they say by the end of the century, the sea level rise there because the city is also sinking, you know, it's built on these logs. I mean, it could be up to four feet. You know, we've got 70,000 houses in New Zealand that are going to be inundated with seawater. And when they started talking about them, it was sort of a couple of decades late, you know, because the amount of money, once the sea level is already, you know, high. And and I get it, people are very attached to their homes, the idea of having to abandon somewhere you've lived. I mean, that's what these poor Panamanians are talking about. You know, this is We've lived here, this is our whole lives, these homes, you know, and to have to uproot. And when you see where they're going to, um, you know, I mean, it's, they've built them homes, which is great. But, you know, that's, you know, I mean, the people of the Carteret Islands, that all their ancestors were buried there. Okay, so this is this, this is where they're going to be. It's a mile inland. It's in jungle. I mean, it couldn't be more different from where they're, you know, I mean, except if it was obviously in a huge metropolis, but it's quite different from, where they are. But the other thing that's great is once they get to the coast, you know, it's an eight minute boat ride, you know, back out to their island. So, you know, they're not being, you know, um, horrible. Yeah, they're not horribly being displaced. trucked to some, you know, remote place. I mean, they are, but yeah, it's a, it's a radical change. Mm. Hey, being yeah. uh, completely consumed by the water around you is a radical change. So I, oh, you know, I mean, yeah. you, you got to take it, but uh, mm. uh, it's a, it's a real great example of what, 
is in the future for so many communities worldwide. And what we're doing in this country, last thing and then we'll wrap up, but yeah. I mean, it, it, we're, we're handling the problem. We're trying to kind of uh, handle the bleeding by doing what you point to in North Carolina, you know, destroying the homes, uh, making sure that the debris doesn't go out to sea, doesn't affect the beach and the natural habitat. But we're not handling the overall problem, the real problem of the climate crisis. We're just trying to build seawalls. That's what we're doing in San Francisco. And that's mm -hmm. what we're doing in uh, coastal communities, again, nationwide. Florida is a classic example. They're trying to build these huge seawalls because the next hurricane, whether it comes in from the Gulf or the Atlantic, is likely stronger, more intense and ferocious. And that aside, that rising of the sea level, that helps with the inundation. I mean, it helps promote essentially an inundation with the next hurricane or tropical weather system. That's that uh, storm surge that you hear about. That's a wall of water and it just destroys everything. Yeah. So we build the seawalls, but you can see how we dig our heels in when it comes to actually acknowledging uh, the climate crisis and the climate chaos. Well, next week we're going to have um, Mark Jacobson, who is an environmental engineer out of Stanford on the show, and he's going to really sort of lay it out how we are making the shift to renewables and what's actually happening. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Then. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, when you when you I mean, his stuff is totally science based and it's really fantastic because he shows you i mean he's got you know i've talked about it before on the show blueprints for 146 countries you know every state in america you know cities like this is what we do this is how much money we save and the fact that it's already underway you know he'll show us what's happening in uh california and in other places so you know help is on the way we just really have to stop burning fossil fuels as soon as possible you can find Belinda Weymouth across social media, Belinda Weymouth, W-A-Y-M-O-U-T-H. She's on the Instagram, she's on the YouTube, she's on uh, Twitter uh, or X. I guess Twitter's going to put the X in X from what I was seeing, by the way. That's a conversation for another day. But you can see her here on Wednesdays. How about it for Belinda Weymouth? Thanks, Belinda. Thank you. Great to be with yeah. you guys. Good, Good to see you. you. That's It's the Planet Stupid for today. More. It's the planet stupid. No, no, no. It's the planet stupid. Next time, only on the Mark Thompson Show. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.